So welcome to Night Hacking at the Geek Out Conference. Um, my name is Stephen Chin. We're live at nighthacking.com, and I'm joined by Thomas. Um, and we're going to chat a little bit about different asynchronous processing topics. So I'm um, very glad to be chatting with you about this stuff. Um, I'm going to hopefully learn a little bit from you about these topics. Um, but tell me a little bit about what you've been working on. So I had a presentation today about completable future. This is something I'm, I'm really passionate about. Uh, we used to have futures since Java 5, and they were really clumsy. They didn't really work as they should, uh, because you didn't like could do it in an event uh, reactive way. Everything yeah. was basically blocking, so you wasted a lot of resources. And completable future is basically a revolution in that, in that area. Now you can apply asynchronous transformations, you can chain futures, you can compose them. So this is just like insanely interesting stuff. And the idea actually comes from Scala, which was implemented there. And it uh, originally came from Twitter, because they needed asynchronous processing for their infrastructure, their, their asynchronous protocol. Uh, so it was ported to Scala, and now suddenly it's, uh, suddenly it's Java. Uh, suddenly it's in Java. It actually takes ideas from Haskell. So you have operators wow, like Wow, so Map. we're getting into the um, functional programming roots of modern programming languages. <laughs> exactly. So you have <laughs> operators that, are, that behave like Map and Flat Map, and, and, and it looks really well. So uh, I, I, like, I'm really happy that we have these tools. They are rather complex, so I spend a whole hour just, just looking at the API and, mm -hmm. and describing various methods. Because previously, Future had just five methods uh, in total, and now it's more than 60. And you really have to understand how to use them, because it's like. Uh, OK, so in a, give me a quick example of where a completable Future would really help you. Um, what sort of programming problem? Would you use okay, it so let's say you're having two servers in two different data centers, yeah. and you would like to get the fastest response. So you are calling the same service on one server and the same service on the other server, and you have no idea which one is faster. So uh, you don't really care which one will reply first. You just want to get the, the, the fastest response. So here you just basically do two requests. You get two completable features in return. Mm -hmm. And then you simply, in the declarative way, say, OK, I want to get the first response to actually arrive and, and apply some transformation. And this is fully non-blocking and even driven. So rather than having callbacks like in JavaScript, for example, which is a nightmare, you apply transformations. So you take two futures, and you get one in return. And this one future actually combines the result of, the, of either the first one or the second one. So this is really massive. And of course, you can scale it to multiple futures. Cool. All right, so that sounds interesting. Um, let's see, you wanted to talk a little bit about parallel streams as well? Uh, yeah, so there are like multiple topics that uh, actually combine into asynchronous processing <laughs> this way uh, these days. So the, the, the one I wanted to just briefly mention was parallel streams. And honestly, I believe they are just like uh, underdeveloped right now. So there was like a lot, a lot of work done with parallel streams. The basic idea was that you take a collection. And rather than doing a stream, which is like an abstraction over collection, and then doing operations sequentially, yeah. like mapping and filtering, you are going for parallel streams. And parallel streams, by definition, should parallelize the work. But it turned out, at the moment, you, th there is no reliable and standard way of supplying your own thread pool into a parallel stream. And there's just one global in a fork join pool. There is a static pool. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a hack where you can get a thread pool yeah, so injected it, in because it, it uses the current thread pool in this. Yes, exactly. So there's like, uh, some say it's a solution, some say it's a hack. I actually heard, I think it was Angelika Langner, if, if I'm not mistaken, and she claims that it can even go away in one of the versions of, of JDK because it wasn't intended to be used this way. Yeah. So uh, it's undocumented and thus shouldn't be relied upon. So it's something I, 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 I don't really want to rely on as well. It's just it, it's broken by design at the moment. It's easy to fix, but with Java 8, uh, it's not something I would use. OK, and what are some examples where you'd actually want to use a different thread pool with parallel streams than the default thread pool? Well, since there's just one thread pool, one global thread pool, and you can still technically have an application server with multiple applications, and they all share a single thread pool. And 
you are supposed to just use a CPU bound tasks inside this one mm -hmm. and inside this thread pool. But what if I have, for example, a set of URLs or a set of services and I want to run all of them in parallel? So I want to make, uh, let's say, 50 concurrent requests at the same time with a parallel stream. In yeah. this case, I'm going to like completely utilize this thread pool and all the other use cases are going to be like starving. Yeah. So. Um Basically, anything which is not CPU bound is going to destroy your yes. your default thread pool when yes. you're trying to do parallel streams. Um, and I guess you can kind of work around it by um, not having those be blocking on your on your parallel stream, but then that doesn't let you fully utilize the new stream. Yeah, API. because I understand that you're supposed to use just CPU bound tasks, but I still have uh, I/O bound tasks or the one that rely on network on disk, whatever, and this just doesn't fit into parallel stream model as it is right now. Cool. Um, all right, so next topic, actors. <laughs> OK, so actors are an extremely cool things. And actually, there's Conrad from TypeSafe looking at me right now. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you can't uh, get this wrong, or Conrad's going to beat you uh, up. Yeah, so I really <laughs> have to be careful what I'm saying. So I think actors are uh, a great way of like abstracting parallel computations, because from a logical perspective, you get one thread per actor, which is not true, but this is like the, the, the logical point of view. So it looks really cool. It does add a little bit of complexity to your design, because suddenly you have a distributed system within your application, because every actor should be treated as, well, I, I, I'm going to say this word just once, a microservice. <laughs> so you have like uh, a lot of communication between actors. And the, the ACA team actually advises you that you should not rely on guaranteed delivery between actors, even if it's just one JVM. Yeah. So, um, you should treat every single actor as a separate process, just as it was with, with Erlang, where the idea actor is actually born. Because as you know, actors aren't really that, uh, that of a new thing. They just have a really good new implementation, really fast, really robust, and uh, very popular these days. So I like Akka, but it's just, uh, it adds some complexity to your application. So if you don't have to use them, uh, just stay with normal, uh, normal synchronization mechanisms. Uh, but they are very good if you're writing heavily parallel applications. OK. So um, are there any, other than going to Scala and using Akka, are there any other actor frameworks out there for your job yeah, application? Yeah, there is, there is a very good uh, and, and general purpose framework called GPARS for Groovy. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a Swiss army knife for parallel uh, computations because they have parallel collections, they have actors, I believe they have agents. They, it's basically a collection of every asynchronous processing parallel framework paradigm known to humanity at the moment. <laughs> so, and, and they actually claim that actor is like the, uh, the, the, the biggest weapon. And if you can avoid it, you should try using simpler abstractions. Okay. Because actors are, are actually quite heavyweight. Maybe it only applies to their implementation. So uh, they have quite a lot of other patterns that, that you can try out. Cool. OK. So we talked about actors. How about agents? OK. Agents are a similar idea. They come from Clojure. And Clojure is an interesting language. I, I can't really stand dynamic typing, but I have a lot of, um, I, I really like the language. So, uh, okay. so lots uh, of interesting uh, ideas, but you prefer statically typed languages in general. Yeah, so, uh, but the idea is that in Clojure, they implemented inside the language, or actually in the standard library, a lot of truly interesting concepts that are uh, helping you to write multi-threaded programs. So these are basically software transactional memory and agents. There are also atoms and refs, which are less relevant, so to speak. So the idea behind agents is actually quite similar to actors, but rather than a stateful actor that has a state and receives messages, mm -hmm. which it interprets on its own. You have an agent, which is basically a simple value, a single value, and you're sending functions to that agent. And a function is supposed to take the current state of the agent yeah. and return a new state. So basically, it's uh, a state okay. transition so it keeps, function. Um, it keeps the agents as being immutable. Yes. Well, it is mutable inside, but it, the only way to apply a transformation is by sending and queuing up functions. Okay. And obviously, the guarantee is that you're not or the agent framework will not execute more than one function at the same time. It's always sequential, and it uses some, some nice tricks to, to avoid it. 
And the simplest idea or simplest example of an, of an agent is basically just a counter, an integer. Mm -hmm. And if you're sending a function increment to it multiple times, you're basically incrementing the value of this counter inside an agent uh, in a thread-safe manner. But it's, it's just the simplest thing. You can have a, connection, uh, sorry, a, a collection inside it or uh, any other data structure you want. OK, so how do um, agents differ in terms of actors um, for? Uh, they don't really that match. As a matter of fact, you can implement agents using actors. And yeah. ACCA also has the implementation of the agent framework. Uh, I think that still applies. So agents are purer from the functional perspective because you're only like working with functions. Mm -hmm. uh, and you still have like access to the okay. state. So you can build an agent framework on top of an actor. You can technically build uh, uh, agents using actors by yeah. just sending functions as messages yeah. to actors. So that okay. would be possible, but not vice versa. Cool. OK. So you want to chat about the software transactional memory? Yeah, that's, that's another cool, cool thing. I have never really tried it because it's like very over the top idea. But still, I think it's, uh, it has a really good foundation. So imagine a relational database which has these ACID uh, characteristics and apply it to your memory. Uh, of course, without durability, because your memory is not durable. But still, what, uh, what it means is that you can take some arbitrary, more or less arbitrary variables in your code, like some collections, values, whatever. And all modifications of these variables must go inside a transaction, a software transaction. So don't confuse it with a database. Yeah. And the idea is that if you surround multiple modifications or multiple reads within a transaction, then all the ACID except D, so AC uh, characteristics still apply. So for example, the modification of just half of these variables isn't visible outside. So as long as you don't commit the, the software transaction, mm -hmm. uh, the changes aren't visible into the outside world. And of course, you can roll back if you throw an exception, for example. And uh, you can have multiple threads reading the data. And well, basically, you have all the semantics of transactions. Okay. So does that improve um, throughput in parallel systems, since you don't actually have the state changing until you commit the transaction? Or yeah, I mean, basically, you don't have to uh, care about two things, uh, like synchronization, so that yeah. the things happen at the same time and not visible uh, like in between. So you have this most common example in, in, in basically at every university when you're transferring money from one account to the other. And you're supposed to like take money from one account and put it on the other. And this has to be atomic. And you should not see these changes uh, in between the, these yeah. operations. So typically, you use locks, which can lead to deadlocks and uh, basically has a poor performance. Yep. If you use software transactional memory instead, uh, you basically say, OK, I have these two accounts, and I'm going to modify them in a transaction. And this way, no one is going to see these changes until you, uh, commit, until you commit them. And then it's visible to everybody who's looking at it yeah. from different threads or contexts. Yeah. Um, are there any examples of systems for Java which um, have a s software transactional memory model? No, I've never really worked with software transactional memory. Uh, I mean, it's... it's uh, it's not a silver bullet, definitely. Yeah. And it has its own issues. For example, it uses uh, multi-version concurrency or optimistic blocking, uh, whatever you call it. So if a transaction fails, it's actually being retried. Yeah. Uh, and it can fail because someone else was modifying the data. So it's fairly optimistic. However, it can fail. So you have to be aware of it that something is being retried. So the functions have to be pure. And suddenly, you are stepping into the more academic area. So uh, I saw implementations of collections that were using software uh, transactional memory. And okay. I saw like, examples, but I've never really used it. But <laughs> there is definitely an implementation in ACCA as well. Uh, I believe in GPARS that we already mentioned. <laughs> And, okay, Conrad's uh, saying it's deprecated. And, and, and I think there are quite a few implementations for pure Java as well. But okay. closure, closure is like the foundation because that one is uh, because that one is built into the language and is being actively supported. Okay, next topic: shared distributed memory. Yeah, so this is something similar to parallel streams. So it kind of exists, but I'm not really in favor of of, of using such such solutions. So one of them is Hazelcast which I honestly really love. I think it's a great library. It seems very lightweight when you're using it, even though it's heavyweight underneath. 
And the basic idea is that you can distribute, for example, collections like maps and queues. A uh, distributed map is like uh, a distributed cache, for example. So you put something on one machine, and then you see this change on the other. Yeah. So it's a simple way of sharing data. And this data doesn't actually live on one node. It's being split into partitions. So it's being into replicated multiple. automatically around yeah, the Yeah, so you have shards, partitions, and like replication, fault tolerance, and all this stuff. So it works really great. Uh, however, I would be... Uh, I think it's not really the best idea to just stuff shared memory into or shared distributed memory into your system, especially if you have a, an application that is not yet distributed and you just simply replace Java Util hash map with concurrent or sorry with distributed map because it has different performance characteristics. And there's this nice quote. I think it was someone from from the TypeSafe team that uh, you should. Uh, share by communication, not communicate by sharing. And this <laughs> means this obviously applies to Akka, where you're just yeah, okay. exchanging so it data. It sounds like um, using a shared distributed memory model actu actually um, has a lot of potential for abuse, because you can simply replace, um, replace communication in a lot of different um, systems where you don't actually understand the performance implications of what you're doing by simply shoving everything into a shared memory map. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, the core problem with distributed, or sorry, with concurrency is that you have to lock concurrent access between threads to the same data. So you have yeah. shared mutable data in one process. And then you're just spreading this problem into multiple, into multiple processes. So that's really bad. Uh, so it's, it's a valuable tool, it's worth knowing it, but uh, you should be careful because it, it might not work as expected. All right, so down our lightning topics list, remote procedure calls leaky abstraction. Okay, so that's kind of a, a broad topic, but the idea is that what I was actually mentioning during my talk. If you're looking at Java code and you see uh, a method invocation that returns a string or an object of type person, you have actually no idea what are the performance characteristics of this method. It can be a simple getter, it can be a database query, or it can go to the internet and fetch something which takes 15 seconds. So the type system doesn't really help you when reading this code that uh, this can be slow or this can be fast. So it's much harder to reason about the actual, uh, the actual performance characteristics. And the idea is that the, the whole point of remote procedure calls or the whole idea of remote procedure calls is kind of flawed because it's, it seems as if it was a local method invocation that are typically slow, uh, sorry, typically fast, yeah. and suddenly you jump into a remote, remote call. So I believe instead you should at least return a future. Uh, you should at least return a future because this way uh, you're signaling the, the user of your library that, okay, this will take a while that the method is itself non-blocking. However, at least uh, I'm returning a future, so you know that there's something going on underneath. Yeah, OK. So you're much better doing something like a completable future where you, you're getting back um, immediate response, and then you know that you're going to get the response back later. Yes. And as opposed to just pretending it's a local method call and then suffering with um, blocking all of your application without really understanding the implications of it. Yeah, and it actually gets much better because you can parallelize. You can yeah. have multiple calls. You can combine them, compose them, chain them, pipeline them, and, and so on and so forth. So it makes... Well, well, you see, you could just jam it all in the default thread pool, and then you can, you can jam up your thread pool with all these remote procedure calls blocking all your threads. Yeah, you have to control that one as well, so well, that's the life. But uh, you're always going to waste at least one thread. So with completable future, you waste one less because you don't block on the client side. OK, so last topic, um, debugging and monitoring asynchronous code. Yeah, that's a, that's a funny story. I mean, previously or in the past where you had no multi-threading or at least you were avoiding it and uh, everything was just happening in a single thread of execution, uh, there wasn't really such a problem because when you're looking at the logs, you would just get operation one, operation two, operation three, and everything was happening in, this, in the same context. Yeah. So even if you had a, a multi-threaded server, you still had one request per one thread. So you could just grab by a thread name and you still get like control and you can, you, you can look at it easily. Now with frameworks like Akka, with parallel streams, with uh, all these ways to split work into multiple threads, this just gets insanely complex. Not to mention that if a synchronous operation fails, 
you don't get the full stack trace. You get a stack trace that closes with a thread pool or yeah. starts with a thread pool, and you have no context who actually executed this task. I, w I, I was doing an experiment that when you're spawning an asynchronous task, you are actually remembering the stack trace of the place that spawned this task. So when you're doing executor service dot submit, I'm kind of remembering when this submit happened. So that if there is an exception in an asynchronous task, uh, I'm not only showing the stack trace of this task, You're which showing isn't the stack very trace of the invoke invoker. Yes, so I'm showing like this is the client stack trace. Yeah. This is where it came from. And this turned out to be pretty useful. And okay. the second Good for debugging, but isn't there a performance penalty for keeping track of all the stack frames along the way? Absolutely. So I mean, this is kind of a trade-off. Do you want to have a traceable system or, uh, or a very fast system? And there's no, there's no clear solution. And we found that keeping correlation ID, which is basically a unique ID kept across all the, all the calls within a single business transaction or a request, it turns out to be extremely useful because you generate a UUID in the beginning, and then you just pass it through all the layers. And then even if it crosses the boundaries of different systems like microservices, you can still filter it out inside, like, for example, Kibana, a, a tool for, for monitoring logs. So this is what we are very often do. Uh, uh, when there is a problem, we just grab by UUID, this uh, transaction ID, and then we see all the logs from all the systems and all the threads that were coming up, uh, that were going in, in the system. So that's, that's a useful thing. OK, cool. So Thanks very much for the brief interview about um, asynchronous processing in Java. And um, I learned a lot. I hope the, the folks at Geekon, Geek Out have learned quite a bit as well. Um, thank you very much for having me here for Night Hacking Interviews. And back over to Simon. Thank you. <laughs>